this round table. Thank you initially, but well, thanks for coming. And thank you to Said, uh, as always, for organising this. Uh, um, so he tends to do the heavy lifting um, and, and we provide uh, the, the room, basically, and no water. Um, <laughs> that um, eight weeks ago I was uh, in Oslo with uh, Mahdi Aberdeen's deputy Jalila Al Salman to participate in the award ceremony of the award to the Bahrain Teachers Association of the highly prestigious Arthur Svensson Award for Trade Union Rights. Now, this is a, the, the combination of Amnesty International uh, and our good friends in the trade union movement will um, be able to come together to generate some fairly significant activity on that case on the 5th of uh, October. And the reason we want to do that is because we're not convinced the Mahdi is safe. Uh, we have seen, as we know, cases where the people have completed their sentences and then they've just been recharged yet again. Um, and, 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 and given that he hasn't been released early, as would, should technically be the case, um, um, we are very concerned that they may wish um, to, 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 to keep him um, um, uh, silent. So that's why we're not uh, giving up. Over 50,000 uh, people signed our petition globally from countries in MENA, in Europe, uh, across the world, um, calling for the re release of prisoners of conscience. Um, this included Nabil Rajab, Zainab Al-Khawaja um, to drop charges and um, quash her conviction, um, <clears throat> and also uh, calling for the release of Sheikh Ali Salman. Um, so the, the reason we did this was because we found that uh, bah the Bahraini government has intensified the crackdown on um, dissenting voices, on human rights activists, defenders, and political activists. Um, there's been a cycle of repression, um, which has resulted in a number of human rights defenders being arrested, detained, and uh, prosecuted. Um, what I wanted to just briefly um, do was look at the UK government's foreign policy. And just to throw in a few things, which I'm sure we will be talking about later. Um, and in this regard, it's hard to find um, new words to, to use when uh, trying to analyze and criticize um, uh, Her Majesty's government. Um, but what I want to do is just sketch very, very briefly some of the points that we've tried to make um, over the last four or five years. In fact, prior to the uh, current crisis, which we all know began in 2011. So um, as long ago as um, June uh, 2011, when we were commenting on the British government's 2010 uh, annual human rights um, and democracy report, we raised the point that um, although there were 26 countries of concern listed um, as, uh, as, as places which um, uh, the FCO was focusing on for s serious human rights violations. Bahrain was not one of them. And we mm. said it should be. So that was, uh, as far as I can recall, the first time we made that point. In um, uh, 2012, in the 2012 uh, report, um, the Foreign Office creatively decided, well, we can find some new words, actually. Um, so that instead of uh, calling Bahrain a country of concern, they, they manufactured this, yeah. this thing called a case study. And Bahrain now fell under this um, new, new category of a place worthy of a case study. Now, I don't know whether one regards that as progress um, or not. Um, <coughs> if one was cynical, one would say that's just, you, you know, rebranding and, and sidestepping the issue. And um, we then, in our annual response to the Foreign Affairs Committee, to the Foreign Office's annual human rights report, said so in words. Um, that, you know, this is, this is just not, doesn't make sense. You know, what is this? What is this? And uh, the Foreign Affairs Committee had started to actually, I think, take the point um, and, and, and started putting a bit of pressure on Her Majesty's government to, you know, not only explain itself as far as Bahrain goes, but to, to really be a bit more kind of transparent on what these countries of concern were. Well, last year, or last year's 
um, report, I should say, which was released this year. So, sorry, let me just be a bit more coherent. The latest uh, Foreign and Commonwealth Office report published in March this year, which deals with 2014, now has a new, uh, or had a new category. This is the, this is the third attempt to, um, to look at Bahrain. And now they have a country case study. So we wanted country of concern, then they had case study, now they've got country case study. But the very latest thing, and you may know this from the media, um, early this month, the Foreign Office has now, and I'm quoting from The Guardian, uh, is dropping the term human rights countries of concern and replacing it with the less critical sounding human rights priority countries. So now they've rebranded the whole thing. Right. Um, which is, um, is interesting. The position of redress is that really, you, you know, changing the names and um, shifting the, the goalposts in their um, annual report is, is rather, um, is rather uh, blatant. And what is needed is for the British government to take a principled stand um, in Bahrain. Now, we've said that. Everybody has said that, um, who, who cares? The question, of course, is, well, you know, they, they're not, are they? So how are we going to try and um, increase the pressure? In 14 February 2011, I was protesting with Bahraini people at Lula Randabout. My dream was have a freedom, justice, and a democracy. I want to talk about what's happening to me in 2013. I was protesting in the Sanabis village. The police is starting to follow me and track me down. I was extremely scared. A police officer ran up behind me, jumping into my back, beamed me down. I know that if he taking me, he will gonna torture me or even kill me. I was very scared as I was on the ground and the police officer put the gun in my head and said to me, do you want me to kill you? I was thrown into the car. They used my t-shirt to cover my face. I had, I had no idea where in they taking me. They punched me into my face and hit me with, his, with their gun and the helmet. The one of officer removed my clothes and put a knife in my penis. and they tore my face to the back of the car. I couldn't see anything. They told me that was gonna cut my penis if I didn't give him the information. The police officer started beating me and torture me. A police officer came over my over and put his foot in my chest, insulting me, saying, sorry about that. Son of, a, son, of the, son of a bitch, do you think I cannot catch you? They all began kicking me all over my body and my face also. And there was blonde all over my face and body. They tortured me more and again and again. After that, I was taken to the detention center. I was so much pain that I was unable to walk, eat or sleep. They refused to let me see the doctor or taking a shower. I was there for a week, unable to speak with my family also. I was, fin I was finally released. Three months later, I was, out I was outside of prison, but I was not free. They continued to contact me, telling me that I had to tell them the information. Otherwise, then they will kill me. They offered me a lot of money if I give him the information. But I refused because I didn't want to work with them. I was very scared that if I start to longer, if I stay longer, then will find me again, torture me or kill me. I know that 
there was no justice in the Bahraini court. And, and then I wanted to leave, to leave a Bahrain. I traveled to UK and claimed asylum in the airport. The Home Office refused my asylum claim and said they will deport me back to Bahrain. The High Court stopped the deportation order. I was, I was then put in the detention center for six months. I was finally given asylum one week ago by the court. I want to continue pushing for human rights and democracy in the Bahrain. So, so that people know what's happening there. Thank you for listening. Okay, thank you, Isa. That's, that's not easy, and it's even more difficult when you have two microphones and cameras, so, so thank you. Um, that's a, I mean, as anyone who's doing research on Bahrain knows, that's a, a harrowing, upsetting, traumatic story, but it's one that, that you hear all too often. You don't have to look particularly hard to find stories like that. Um, so despite the claims that, that progress is being made, and I think it's would be incorrect to say that the institutional mechanisms which can in the future be effective is not necessarily a bad thing. Um, but torture is still going on in Bahrain, um, and anyone claiming anything to the contrary uh, is misguided. So at the time where a Bahraini get convicted, and if uh, the Home Office just wanted insist to report him back to Bahrain, uh, We've seen the invitation of uh, or ongoing advice to the Bahraini friends who his immunity, diplomatic immunity, was quashed by High Court in the UK. He continued to, to get uh, red uh, card treatment in the UK. And that is just like a very worrying uh, level standard. I think in this case, is one of the clearest, in my opinion. There is a clear shift about how the Home Office been treating Bahrain. I myself attended a number of hearings and uh, how, how the Home Office now taking the side of the government that Bahrain now is reforming, they have created an ombudsman office and these things and they are reforming and if you don't have any serious charges then you could go back to Bahrain and no one would do anything to you. And this was the case of Hussein Jawaz. Hussein Jawaz is the chair of the European Center for Human Rights in Bahrain. Uh, and uh, and basically he he waited here for over uh, <coughs> over six months certainly without any response on his asylum claim despite that his he was a prisoner of conscience according to amnesty and there were tens of NGOs who supported his case all of this evidence has not resulted to solve his his asylum case and this is why he waited too long and decided to go back to Bahrain. He wasn't arrested immediately when he arrived to Bahrain, but later on he was arrested, being tortured, and you know, most of you heard his story. So there is a clear shift about how this language of the government been changing dramatically the position of the Home Office whenever they look into any asylum claim from coming from Bahrain. It doesn't mean that we shouldn't perhaps work to change some political opinion in the UK. I mean, I've certainly been very disappointed by um, the FCO um, uh, uh, official line response that I've received from my MP. We made perhaps a mistake in um, making the Bahrainis the targets of our interventions. Um, it strikes me that they aren't responsive um, uh, to us, and, and, and as we've been hearing, it might be factors within the region that bring back change rather than our efforts to influence them. Um, I don't think the UK government can be shifted easily. Um, um, they've made a decision, it's a clear decision, and I actually think that the, you know, one of the dimensions that keeps that relationship going is the military dimension. I think we need to, to recognize that as well. Um, but that doesn't mean that we shouldn't perhaps work to change some political opinion in the UK. I mean, I've certainly been very disappointed by um, the FCO um, uh, 
uh, official line of response that I've received from my MP. Um, and given that Amnesty is an activist movement, and given in particular that we have um, a large number of young supporters deeply concerned about Mahdi's case and who understand the situation, then I think we might be looking at some sort of public activism that is targeted to either to the UK government or to um, um, uh, or to MPs. Now, on behalf of the case of Dr. Alison Gates, who is an academic and blogger um, who was sentenced to life in prison in 2011. Um, we're now approaching, I think, the 150th day of his hunger strike, um, so obviously quite serious concern to his health at the moment. Um, so we're continuing an online campaign. The hashtag is Singace Hunger Strike, and if everyone's able to kind of get involved with that, that would be wonderful. Um, thank you. Well, you know, we're human rights campaigners, and that makes us natural optimists. We know change is hard uh, to deliver, um, and sometimes comes very slowly at great personal cost. Uh, to brave uh, prisoners of conscience and human rights defenders, but that's not a reason to give up. Amnesty doesn't give up and won't uh, give up on Bahrain. Now, it's important as well for us to make a distinction between the position of the government in terms of its collaboration uh, with the uh, Bahrain authorities and its failure to insist that human rights norms are upheld. It's important to make a distinction between the government and public opinion uh, in the UK. And public opinion in the UK is something that we can certainly influence. Yeah, uh, I mean, it's a very difficult political context to what's happening in Bahrain just now. The uh, British government is very influential um, at the level of the EU and internationally. Um, and so efforts to, to call Bahrain to account for what is going on have frequently been undermined by, by the British government's position. Um, as to what we can do about that, again, it's, it's, a, it's a difficult question and, and one which, to which I have no satisfactory answer other than to say that the British government's narrative on Bahrain um, is, is, is flawed. It presents a, an overly optimistic um, assessment of, of the true situation. I think our job is to present the true situation and to encourage people to challenge the British government uh, on its position. Um, that's what we try to do uh, with good, strong research, um, uh, and the success of that uh, depends on, on the success of our efforts to convince influential actors to, um, to be critical of the British government. I think that the only thing that um, human rights organisations, such as the Redress Trust, which I come from, um, can do is to, is to continue to try to um, expose the British government's um, double standards when it comes to Bahrain, to expose it to the um, British um, media, to the, to the British parliament, um, and in, in the wider sense to therefore make it clear to um, Britain's uh, other uh, allies in uh, Europe um, that its policy is wrong. The difficulty with the European Union is that um, Britain has been given the task of leading the uh, foreign policy, in effect, um, on Bahrain. So it's, it's in this position where it um, can itself try and um, influence the other European states um, in, in a rather negative way to say, well, you know, we've got to support this, the, the reform which um, is the British government's uh, position. So there's no, there's no shortcut really um, other than for the uh, human rights organizations to keep um, looking very, very closely at what the Foreign Office says and, and does. The um, recent general election and the election of the Conservative government is not um, a good step in the sense that they um, have not shown any uh, change of policy. But we have to wait and see what, um, what happens and really to challenge it um, and to um, expose the, uh, the double standards. Because this is the key problem, that the Foreign Office is selective in which countries it criticizes, which countries it puts pressure on. And that's not right. Um, you know, torture 
is torture is torture, whoever commits it. I think it was very interesting. The position of everybody is very rich and very diverse, and to have the stance of like people which have a different experience on what happened in Bahrain and what is happening, and their work also is very very impressive. And like having like wit witnesses from the field is very very I think rich for everybody here. So.